एक मिनट डॉक्टर शाह सम पीपल आर ज्वाइनिंग जस्ट वेट में जस्ट वन मिनट yes now you can continue please thank you thank you yushe so we so thank you everyone for attending um, yes this is the second uh, uh, lecture uh, in this uh, uh, after the first lecture which i actually introduced uh, the basic concepts in uh, neurotransmitter systems and the receptors and other messenger systems as well uh, so we were able to um, uh, finish uh, the uh, glutamate uh, receptors um, uh, the no, the information about the glutamate system uh, and um, we we decided that we are going to finish with the rest of the uh, the the neurotransmitter and receptor uh, uh, lect a couple of lectures on on those topics so today uh, you know i'm going to start with gaba which is a gaba amino butyric acid uh, commonly known as gaba um Uh, so the so uh, those of you who have missed the first lecture um, you know uh, you will have the opportunity to see the the recorded session uh, last week uh, that will be important because that you know without that it is going to be little bit uh, uh, a little bit difficult to understand uh, the uh, other lectures uh, but um, so let's begin with with gaba so as we spoke last week uh, uh, glutamate and gaba uh, actually are the two major neurotransmitter systems uh, which actually um, are responsible for the majority of uh, um, uh, brain functions in relation to the neuro neurotransmitter systems uh, and they actually i showed you a pie chart in which glutamate and gaba were actually Uh, were several fold more than the dopamine serotonin and the monoamine uh, systems and the uh, and 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 the um, uh, uh, other receptors which are involved in brain function so these are the most important uh, brain functions and 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 it is understandable because glutamate system uh, uh, is uh, while it is excitatory gaba system uh, is the most uh, uh, important inhibitory system in the brain uh so keep the checks and balances uh, in in the brain function so these two systems actually are surprisingly very close uh, as i discussed uh, in the last lecture but they have completely completely opposite uh, mechanism of action which is really a miracle of nature that uh, one receptor forms the other one but but the mechanism of action of that receptor uh, i'm sorry neurotransmitter system which we are going to talk uh, which is gaba actually is completely opposite uh, uh, to the parent compound which is glutamate so so the you know it never ceases to surprise me how uh, you know complicated um, and fascinating the brain systems are <clears throat> so let me uh, yeah i'm not able to uh, move the slide hold on yeah okay so basically um, the gaba receptors are of two uh, actually of three types um, uh, uh, gaba a and gaba c are the inotropic receptors uh, but uh, in contrast to glutamate receptors inotropic receptors uh, i know uh, the gaba a and gaba c receptors are uh, controlled by the electrolyte uh, chlo chloride Uh, by through the chloride channels as you can see in the diagram uh, so there is a difference between the two uh, of course calcium enters the neurons it is excitatory but when uh, uh, chloride enters uh, the ion channel it is inhibitory so that explains uh, why these uh, two systems are are the way they are uh, excitatory and inhibitory right so, uh, there is another gaba receptor which is called gaba b so gaba b receptor actually uses potassium channels uh, so you see the role of these different electrolytes uh, uh, in mediating the functions of these receptors uh, that is another uh, uh, important thing to notice uh, and that is why when there is an electrolyte imbalance uh, because of uh, so many different medical conditions your brain function may be affected uh, as a matter of fact bipolar affective disorder has the strongest evidence 
of uh, issues with the with the uh, electrolyte channels uh, and that is why a lot of most stabilizers actually work in stabilizing these uh, ion channels um so um, for gaba a i forgot to tell you for for gaba a we all know which are the agonists right benzodiazepines uh, and barbiturates and alcohol um, and and and, and uh, so many other uh, agents right with the gaba b the agonist is baclofen i'm sure uh, uh, every one of you would would know baclofen because it is one of the most effective uh, medication to uh, to stop the uh, the spasms the muscle spasms and uh, but there are very few people know that gaba b receptors are are in, uh, also very important in the gut function mm -hmm. Uh, and they actually uh, uh, make some of the gut uh, neurotransmitters, uh, neurotransmitters, which are present in the gut. Um, since GABA is an inhibitory system, it actually inhibits serotonin in, in the GI tract. Um, that is one of the reason, uh, um, not the reason, but but this is fascinating because uh, in the uh, carcinoid syndrome, where uh, serotonin is uh, produced in huge amounts. Uh, uh, you know, this GABA B um, uh, activity might uh, be able to neutralize some of those effects. Uh, although if it is overwhelms GABA B receptors, of course, uh, you see the symptoms, the peripheral symptoms, uh, which are observed in um, uh, carcinoid syndrome. So there is this common expression, which we sometimes use as uh, uh, gut feeling. Um, and gut feeling is, is not a new concept in relation to the uh, neurotransmitter systems. But also, uh, you know, we, we don't have time to discuss, but uh, the gut flora, which is considered uh, the second brain uh, in human body, uh, you won't believe, a uh, lot of people don't know that the gut flora actually makes uh, all the major neurotransmitter systems which are, which are available in the brain. Uh, so, so the gut feeling actually is, is not a, 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 a misperception. Uh, there is definitely scientific evidence for gut feeling. So when you look at this diagram, uh, you will see that there are different sites uh, within the receptor, um, uh, GABA receptor. And this is a GABA A receptor. I've not shown you GABA B. So this is GABA A, which is an inotropic receptor. So that, that is why you see an electrolyte channel, which is shown in the center uh, chloride channel. You can see that uh, on the upper slide on the right side. And then there's a separate site for benzodiazepine. So actually benzodiazepine uh, uh, has a, 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 a exclusive site for its activity on the GABA receptor. Uh, and then there's a steroids uh, site and there is a, a different site for barbiturates and alcohol. Um, picrotoxin is a very interesting agent because it is a very potent inhibitor of GABA uh, A receptor. And that is why it can result in convulsions, um, uh, uh, which uh, the basic, uh, you know, uh, everybody knows about that. Picrotoxin is a neurotoxic agent, right? <clears throat> um, GABA, uh, GABA uh, is a, uh, actually glutamate is the precursor for GABA, as I already told you. Now this is um, again a very uh, slightly complex uh, uh, diagram, but it just shows you that how GABA uh, actually has the uh, tripartite system uh, just as uh, glutamate, as we discussed uh, discussed last week. Uh, and you can see that uh, the GABA can be reuptaken by the astrocyte or the glia, as well as a presynaptic neuron, uh, and um, and uh, actually when it goes into the glial cell. It can be re, it can reconvert into glutamate, and then the glutamine goes out to enter the presynaptic neuron, and there it is broken inside by glutamine is, which actually makes glutamate, uh, and then that glutamate is available to go into the vesicle and then be released through excitosis, exocytosis in the synaptic cleft. So this is this is the, the, the extreme close uh, interaction between glutamate and GABA. That's uh, fascinating. Uh, so GABA A binding sites, uh, uh, we have already discussed these. Uh, uh, the agonist uh, uh, is, is uh, muscimol, uh, muscimol and the um, antagonist are strychnine. Uh, 
uh, and picrotoxin, as I, I told you, and and this uh, cycloculine, uh, which is another research uh, agent, is not approved as a drug, I think. Um, and then benzodiazepine are indirect agonist. Why? Because they are not binding to the primary site. They have separate. Uh, uh, they they sort of called, I think, uh, co agonist. Um, natural inverse agonist. Um, uh, and, and uh, actually, these, these um, uh, benzodiazepines, as we all know, very well aware of that uh, they are indirect agonists, but they are very closely related with fear, feelings of fear, tension, and anxiety, as we all know. <clears throat> uh, tranquilizing drugs, um, they, can, they are uh, absolutely anxiolytics, uh, but there are uh, uh, several issues uh, of using them. Everybody but you would know. If anybody has question, uh, you know, uh, bonds, wants to ask question next time in the interactive section uh, session, we can discuss more. Um, site for alcohol, barbiturates, phenobar, pentobar, steroids, picrotoxin. We already um, actually uh, picrotoxin is an antagonist, but it is an antagonist through inverse agonism. Remember, in the first lecture, we talked about inverse agonists are the most potent antagonist. Uh, so. Don't uh, please don't think that Dr. Shah is using uh, is confusing you, right? Uh, so this is very uh, important to understand that inverse agonist is is the most potent uh, uh, antagonist because it complete it locks the receptor as you saw in the last lecture, right? Yeah. And uh, let's see, GABA B, uh, the agonist we already talked about, baclofen. We talk, uh, there is an antagonist as as well. Uh, it is called faclofen, so there's not much of a difference, easily can be confused. Um, so the uh, psychopathology uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, associated with GABA and glutamate, um, I think I, it would not be uh, uh, overstatement to say that GABA and glutamate actually uh, form the basis of so many different psychiatric disorders across the brain uh, because they are so ubiquitous uh, throughout the brain they affect uh, every mechanism, every action in the brain. So it is not surprising that they are involved in, in so many different psychopathologies. Um, uh, just to give you a few examples, because I don't want to have this as a completely a basic lecture. I want to give you some clinical example because without that, it doesn't mean much uh, to you guys, right? Uh, so basically uh, the GABA system, uh, the relationship with psychopathology, is we already discussed that the GABA um, uh, receptors are involved with anxiety, tension, uh, and, and fear, uh, as we discussed earlier. Um, and, 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 uh, in, 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 and so that, that is common knowledge. Uh, but a but lot of, uh, very few people know that GABA actually is a system which plays uh, a very important role in affective disorders uh, and also bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So again, uh, I, I'm repeating myself that, that these systems are important in so many different psychopathologies. So let just let me give you one example because we don't have time to go in details. But uh, one of the example is, uh, uh, you know, GABA uh, is recently, uh, there is a, uh, there is a uh, uh, I think you would know that progesterone, uh, which is a, a, a hormone uh, in females, actually is converted into allopregnenone, uh, which is its a primary metabolite. And allopregnenone is, is uh, uh, considered to be a highly psychoactive agent. Uh, 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 and, and it actually has been involved uh, uh, in, in, especially recently, we have seen a lot of evidence that it is involved in, uh, in, 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 in affective or the depressive symptoms. Um, but not the usual uh, affective symptoms so far, although there are some trials going on. But one I'm talking about is the postpartum depression because uh, brexinolone, which is a analog of uh, allopregnolone, uh, 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 has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of postpartum depression. That tells you how important these mechanisms can be in the most severe type of de depression ever known to, to human beings. Which is post, uh, which is postpartum depression, and actually is a medical psychiatric uh, emergency, right? Um, in terms of glutamate, I will give you one example. Um, 
which actually I touched uh, last time as well, but there's so much to talk about glutamate. Uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, we don't have time to do that, but one of the most important clinical application you would understand about glutamate is that um, uh, glutamate uh, has, uh, uh, in the last lecture we discussed, glutamate has inotropic receptors and uh, metabotropic receptors, both types. But the inotropic receptor of which NMDA receptor is a very well-known receptor, actually is extremely important uh, 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 in terms of mediation of uh, psychosis as well as uh, depressive symptoms and suicidality uh, as we, uh, be, uh, not directly, but indirectly. So we'll talk about that. So glutamate, uh, uh, the NMDA receptors are actually uh, antagonized by ketamine uh, as well as phencyclidine. Uh, uh, when we, can use, we cannot use phencyclidine in the treatment of depression because phencyclidine is a very, very potent uh, a drug and it actually uh, uh, is uh, uh, results in extreme uh, psychosis uh, and schizophrenic syndrome, which is which resembles schizophrenia as we discussed last time. Uh, but uh, ketamine is a is a much uh, lower affinity, uh, much less potent uh, NMDA receptor blocker, and even with that, we are so cautious that we use a very uh, small dose of ketamine infusions or the intranasal spray is Pravato, which was approved by the FDA recently for the treatment of depression um, as a uh, co-treatment. Uh, it is not supposed to be used uh, as a mon monotherapy. So, so basically uh, uh, we use very low dose of ketamine, uh, uh, even though it is less potent than phencyclidine. And, and, and the, the mechanism of uh, uh, glutamate, uh, uh, the, the uh, ketamine induced uh, uh, rapid antidepressant and rapid uh, uh, anti-suicidal effect uh, is very complex and, and beyond, we, we don't have time to discuss, but just to make sure that you know that NMDA receptor uh, uh, antagonism is not uh, the main reason why we see antidepressant effect. This is the cascades of reaction which happens after an NMDA receptor blockage, which actually results in antidepressant effects. For example, uh, NMDA receptor block, uh, blockade results in excessive release of glutamate, and then that excessive release of uh, glutamate is available to act on other uh, glutamate receptors. And, and most important ones from those is, are the AMPA receptors, which actually eventually result in the uh, uh, release of uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is one of the most remarkable uh, surrogate marker for antidepressant effects. Biogenic amines, so let's move on to uh, the, the dopamines and the serotonins and the, and the norepinephrine systems uh, uh, in the brain. Um, uh, so we all know that uh, these examples for biogenic amines uh, uh, are uh, acetylcholine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and uh, serotonin. Uh, so there is a difference between uh, uh, the uh, uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine because they, they are called catecholamines, but serotonin is not a catecholamine. It is an endolamine. <clears throat> Acetylcholine was actually the first neurotransmitter uh, which was described uh, uh, first ever uh, to be described. Uh, and, uh, these, uh, uh, and this neurotransmitter system is actually synthesized from choline uh, and the enzyme which mediates that, that uh, uh, reaction or the um, uh, formation of acetylcholine is the choline acetyl, acetyl uh, transferase, which we all know because if we have read any uh, drugs which are used to treat uh, Alzheimer's uh, dementia. Uh, we know that how important this enzyme is so that when you block it, you prevent the excessive, the metabolism of acetylcholine so that it can be available more. Um, so as soon as acetylcholine, like any other neurotransmitter system, as soon as they are synthesized, the neurotransmitter is synth synthesized, it is actually uh, stored in within the synaptic vesicles uh, as is true for for other neurotransmitter systems. Um, they are mostly, the effects mediated by acetylcholine are mostly excitatory. And this is the synthesis, we already talked about that. And uh, the drug is removed by uh, acetylcholine esterase. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, when I, so when I talked about the Alzheimer's, actually that is uh, not the acetyl transferase uh, 
choline uh, acetyl transferase, but it's acetyl choline uh, acetase, which is inhibited. Uh, <clears throat> Um, there are two receptor types, uh, nicotinic and muscarinic. Uh, nicotinic are, uh, are inotropic and muscarinic are metabotropic. Uh, it's very important. One of the things which I didn't tell you in the first lecture is, I remember now, is that you should know that the nicotinic receptors, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the inotropic receptors are fast acting. So when, uh, so when uh, uh, receptor uh, uh, electrolyte passes through the, the ion channel, in an ionotropic receptor, uh, the, the effects are, are much more uh, rapid than the effects mediated by metabotropic receptors. That's a major, major difference. I should have talked about that. Um, locations, uh, so let's not uh, spend time on this. Let's go to the different tracts in the brain. Um, so the, one of the major uh, origin of uh, 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 place of synthesis in the brain for acetylcholine is uh, the nucleus bacillus of uh, Meinert. Uh, and this question is often asked in the MCQ. So, uh, you know, a lot of people know this uh, or have read about this. So nucleus bacillus of Meinert is uh, actually where the, uh, the cholinergic tracts uh, originate from. Uh, so the first one is actually maybe the one of the most important ones because it runs from the nucleus to the hippocampus and amygdala and we know that the role of acetylcholine uh, uh, um, uh, in the hippocampus uh, is, is, uh, is uh, uh, indispensable. Uh, it's very important because acetylcholine is involved uh, uh, in formation of memories, uh, long-term potentiations and all those along with glutamate systems. Uh, so they interact. Uh, amygdala uh, is also important because amygdala is the fear center of the brain and acetylcholine uh, may be uh, being an excitatory neurotransmitter may actually have uh, uh, not so good effect uh, in terms of anxiety and fear and stress and tension. Uh, but there are many other systems which interact, so uh, it may not be the most important one. Uh, frontal cortex, um, we all know that how important, um, uh, you know, the uh, especially the um, uh, uh, the um, uh, acetylcholine function is in the frontal cortex. Uh, you must remember, uh, you may have remembered from uh, studying the uh, anticholinergic medications, uh, how uh, they can compromise uh, cognitive function, including the higher cognitive functions, the higher order cognitive functions, which are sometimes uh, labeled as executive function. Uh, your attention concentration is impaired. Why is that? because these uh, acetylcholinergic uh, uh, the uh, tracts from the nucleus bacillus actually go to the uh, frontal cortex and they interact with dopamine systems uh, to help uh, uh, form uh, 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 executive functions and other uh, uh, cognitive functions. Neocortex, so these are the receptors which are actually involved with some other functions of the higher cortical centers. Uh, including the, 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 the motor functions. Okay, so those were the major tracks with the cholinergic system. Uh, psychopathology, we have already talked about this. Function, uh, we have uh, talked about that, but, but just to make another point, uh, hippocampus, we talked about memory, right? Medial septum, basal forebrain, um, attention concentration, we talked about dorsolateral pons, uh, REM sleep. Uh, remember, uh, I forgot to tell you, that the cholinergic uh, input into the PGO, uh, uh, the pontogeniculo occipital uh, uh, ne uh, neurons, actually are result result for the spikes in the uh, to actually initiate the REM sleep. So the cholinergic systems are very important uh, uh, to initiate REM sleep. That is why drugs which cause uh, which have anticholinergic effects are not helpful in giving you a restful sleep. Although we know that uh, Benadryl or diphenhydramine, which is uh, not only an antihistaminic agent, but also a potent anticholinergic agent may help you sleep, but it may not give you restful sleep because diphenhydramine blocks acetylcholine and, and that may actually interfere with the, with the REM sleep. Um, there are different type of acetylcholine receptors. Uh, uh, M1 through through F5 uh, and and uh, so you know uh, 
Time is an issue because uh, uh, some of these receptors are extremely uh, interesting to know about. I will just discuss M1 and M4 because those are a little bit more uh, interesting. So M1 receptor is the one which is primarily responsible uh, for the dryness of mouth. Uh, if you block this receptor, dryness of mouth, blurring of vision, tachycardia, constipation, um, uh, confusion, um, um, uh, retention of urine, uh, uh, and, and also worsening of the closed ang angle glaucoma and the loss of sweating, uh, which is actually the mechanism when we give uh, anticipatory medications with the anticholinergic effects. We are always concerned about uh, the heat stroke because uh, sweating uh, is, a, uh, is a protective mechanism uh, against heat and that is uh, uh, compromised with anticholinergic agents. Um, so M1 is the, mo the, the most uh, 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 abandoned uh, transmitter in relation to, uh, to acetylcholine. Uh, and these are the muscarinic receptors. Uh, sorry, I should have told you. So there are two types. We've already discussed that muscarinic and, nic and nicotinic receptors. These are muscarinic as M stands for. So M4 receptors, uh, although this slide says it is not known, but these are relatively old slides. Uh, so, so now we know that M4 receptor actually antagonism uh, may be helpful. <clears throat> excuse me, may be helpful um, uh, in mediating some mediating some of the uh, see uh, antidepressant effects. Uh, so there's some research uh, <clears throat> has been going on with that. M4 receptor is also important because you know one of the drug which is, is still the gold standard. Uh, to treat a treatment refractory schizophrenia, which is a clozapine, actually is a M1 antagonist, but it is an M4 agonist. And a lot of people uh, actually, uh, it is not proven by the research, but a lot of people hypothesize that uh, when you see drooling with clozapine, that actually may be mediated by M4 rather than the blockade of the M1 because that's impossible because anticholinergic effects uh, results in dryness of mouth. <clears throat> Nicotine. So nicotine is uh, um, uh, uh, is is the the other important type of receptors with acetylcholine function, uh, and and they um, uh, actually uh, you know it will be uh, it will be nice to talk about the effect of smoking because that's what uh, nicotine delivers to to the brain. Um, and nicotine, uh, you know, is very commonly used in schizophrenia population. Uh, anywhere between 80 to 90% of the schizophrenia patients, uh, uh, if they have access to, uh, to cigarettes, they, they will smoke, at least here in America. Uh, and, 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 and so a lot of people say that, why is that the case? That nicotine is much, uh, uh, much more highly uh, used uh, than, than the general population among schizophrenics. Um, so I think uh, that actually uh, will easier for you to remember that nicotinic receptors actually enhance cognitive function. Actually, nicotinic receptors uh, uh, improve the, the gating phenomenon uh, in, the, in the thalamus, uh, which is the relay station of the brain, uh, because um, uh, uh, the sensory overload is a major problem in schizophrenia because the brain is not able to filter out unnecessary information. So everything goes to the, to the brain and patients become confused and they start to hallucinate and, uh, and be deluded. Uh, but, but nicotine actually improves at least the gating function phenomenon, uh, which actually uh, uh, improves the filtration of unnecessary information reaching the brain. So that is why I think the schizophrenia patients may use it because it makes them feel better. Another uh, reason for nicotine uh, use uh, in, in schizophrenia uh, is that uh, some uh, uh, medications uh, are actually uh, induced by, by uh, cigarette smoking. Um, and uh, it includes clozapine, it includes olanzapine. Uh, th these are the two major ones. So when uh, smoking induces the metabolism of clozapine and olanzapine, olanzapine it is rather known as an unconscious uh, mechanism uh, to get rid of the drug uh, because, uh, 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 of course, unknowingly, unknowingly, un unknowingly. Uh, but but I think everybody knows that uh, the patients may actually start to feel better 
uh, if there is a decrease in lanzapine and, and clozapine level just for a short period of time though. I don't want to confuse you and misguide you. Uh, you remember this, this may be a good thing to remember that when you stop a medication, the side effects of the medication goes much before the efficacy goes. So when there's a reduction in uh, initial re reduction in uh, levels of lanzapine and, and clozapine, patients feel a little bit better because those are the immediate effects. Uh, but, but don't never forget that over the weeks or months, patient will relapse because the loss of efficacy occurs over a longer period of time. So I took uh, decades to learn this, uh, uh, but it is a very helpful uh, 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 kind of point to remember. Okay. So we talked about uh, nicotine uh, and also uh, I think uh, uh, just briefly I would mention that uh, there are some nicotinic agonists. Uh, uh, there are some receptors like alpha-7, beta-4, alpha-2 uh, receptors. Uh, and some of these are actually used, you know, uh, the, uh, the medic uh, uh, shantix, which is used to, to smoke, smoke, uh, stop smoking, actually works on the on the uh, beta-4 uh, uh, alpha-2 receptors. Uh, and it's, I think it is a partial agonist. So that is a mechanism which actually has been actually uh, most effective in terms of drug therapy for uh, cigarette smoking cessation programs. Um, alpha-7 receptors are not workable because they are rapidly adaptable. So any drugs which is given to act on the alpha-7 receptors, actually there is a rapid uh, uh, tolerance to the drug effects. So that has not been uh, useful. Um, catecholamine synthesis, uh, I think uh, just to save some time, um, very, very quickly, tyrosine is the main amino acid uh, which forms uh, dopa uh, and then the dopa becomes dopamine through dopa decarboxylase. Uh, uh, remember we talked about cinnamate, uh, that uh, levodopa is given with carbidopa uh, and the carbidopa is the inhibitor of decarboxylase. So more of the drug can reach the brain, right? Um, so tyrosine, dopa, dopamine, and dopamine converts into uh, norepinephrine. And then the PMT, PNMT, uh, uh, which is the methyl transferase enzyme, converts norepinephrine into epinephrine. Um, let me get out of this and see if I can come back. Okay. So let's talk about dopamine. Um, so it is, uh, and I'll show you the main tracts because this is going to be a, a little uh, more detailed discussion because the tracts are extremely important, especially in schizophrenia with antipsychotic medications. We need to have a good concept about those. Um, so dopamine uh, located uh, 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 primarily in the frontal lobe and the limbic system in the substantia nigra, as we all know, the role of dopamine in Parkinson's is uh, via substantia nigra. Um, there are subtypes, five subtypes, uh, D1, uh, actually they are classified into two major uh, types, D1-like and D2-like. So the D1-like include D1 and D5, and the D2-like include D2, D3, and D4. Um, but D2 is again further subdivided into a short and a long type, and, and that is extremely important clinically. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to go into those details, but uh, their location uh, and their effect of the antipsychotic drugs on those two uh, subtypes is extremely important in terms of mediation of adverse effects, uh, especially extrapyramidal symptoms. Um, uh, so um, they, uh, dopamine uh, are, are uh, actually generally are inhibitory. Uh, so the D2 receptor, uh, I think somebody asked me a question 
about uh, D2 receptor last time. So D2 receptors are actually autoreceptors. Uh, and, uh, and they actually, when they are stimulated, uh, actually decreases the flow of dopamine from the presynaptic neuron. So that actually explains uh, why the two receptors can be, uh, can be uh, inhibitory. But if there is deficiency of dopamine, then the D2 uh, receptors probably will increase the, the release of dopamine. Because remember, these autoreceptors um, uh, are a negative feedback control, as we discussed last time. Okay. Um, decreased in Parkinson's, um, increased in schizophrenia. Uh, uh, we know that there is a dopaminergic hypothesis of schizophrenia. Uh, we are working with some applicants uh, uh, to talk about the different hypotheses of schizophrenia. Uh, and one group is involved with looking at the, uh, these different hypotheses uh, uh, in terms of explaining the pathophysiological underpinnings of schizophrenia. And dopaminergic, uh, so there is another hypothesis uh, which is called glutamatergic hypothesis. Uh, it may also be known as hypoglutamatergic hypothesis. It may also be known, uh, well, it is less known, but my viewpoint is that there could be a hyper uh, glutamatergic hypothesis as well. And some people agree with that. And the reason uh, I explained, uh, I, I came up with that idea, I'll, I'll explain you a little while uh, in a little bit. So, dopaminergic hypothesis. Uh, why it into came into existence? Because we knew that the stimulant can cause psychosis uh, and a stimulant uh, increased dopamine. Uh, so we just added one plus one and it, uh, and it actually supports that when you give a dopaminergic drug, it in increases psychosis. So that was the first basis of hypothesis. The second basis, uh, because you have to prove this, uh, one evidence is not enough uh, to create a hypothesis. So the next uh, proof is uh, evidence is that when you block uh, the antipsychotic, uh, uh, the receptors with the antipsychotic drug, it improves psychosis, which supports dopaminergic hypothesis. But it does not, I would, I would re-emphasize it, does not explain the other core symptoms, uh, symptom domains of schizophrenia. So the stimulants don't cause cognitive problems. As a matter of fact, in ADSD, they improve cognitive performance, right? Um, um, and uh, uh, stimulants don't cause the, uh, the negative symptoms. Uh, on the contrary, actually, they, they cause positive symptoms, um, uh, as, as we know. So negative symptoms are uh, evolution, anhedonia, uh, asociality, uh, elogia, all those you add a in front of any expression, it becomes a negative symptoms. Uh, in the contrary, on the contrary, glutamatergic hypothesis actually supported by the fencyclidine induced psychosis. I mentioned that many times in the past, right? In the first lecture as well. Um, so uh, so um, uh, that is the reason why we think that the glutamate modulators uh, such as cycloserine, uh, uh, serine and glycine actually can improve psychosis because they are glutamate modulators. Um, and one of the most fascinating thing about glutamatergic hypothesis is that glutamatergic hypothesis, hypothesis explains all core domain sim symptoms of schizophrenia, even including the electrophysiological and affective symptoms. Uh, uh, this, so this is uh, one of the most, uh, not one of them, but the most perfect pharmacological model of schizophrenia uh, uh, is glutamatergic uh, hypothesis. Um, so, uh, so when you give fencyclidine, uh, you will not only can induce psychosis, but you can uh, also induce uh, uh, the negative symptoms and as well as the cognitive symptoms. So that is why there has been shift from dopaminergic to glutamatergic hypothesis uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and we are moving beyond monoamines, not only in, in, in depression or affective disorders, but also in schizophrenia, as you know. Uh, because with, with monoamines, we are moving beyond serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine and moving to NMD receptors, the ketamine story, right? Uh, and, and the GABA story, I just told you. So, uh, so the reason, uh, coming back to the point I made earlier, that why I, 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 disagree, I called glutamatergic hypothesis sometimes as a hyper hyperglutamatergic hypothesis. Uh, a lot of people prefer hypoglutamatergic hypothesis. So let me tell you the fact. I think uh, may not be the fact, but the major observation I've made from the review studies and other research papers is that 
actually it is not the glutamate overactivity or underactivity which uh, is causing problem. Um, um, actually, it is the dysregulation of the function. So, for example, um, a, a deficiency in glutamate function is as bad as excessive activity of glutamate. So the glutamate function has to be fine-tuned to a baseline normal uh, uh, homeostatic mechanism where it can uh, function uh, 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 optimally. So that is the main thing. So hypoglutamatergic hypothesis is true when the patient is having problem with the cognition, uh, with the with affective symptoms, uh, uh, with the uh, slowing of uh, you know attention concentration, such as uh, and the memory problems. So that is hypoglutamatergic. In in those patients, it may be really helpful, uh, although it is it may change back and forth. Uh, that that is maybe the reason why uh, agents like uh, glutamate modulators, like cycloserine and serine and glycine, uh, have uh, shown some efficacy in the treatment of schizophrenia symptoms. But on the other hand, the hyperglutamatergic is also a fact, uh, at least in some brain re uh, regions, especially uh, hippocampus. Excessive glutamatergic uh, activity actually causes neuronal loss, known as apoptosis. And that actually is mediated by the rapid influx of calcium into the neuron, uh, resulting in uh, death of the neuron. Uh, and, and that also is known as glutamatergic excitotoxicity. So, so that also is happening in schizophrenia because we are losing brain matter, right? Neurons. Uh, so, so I think all in all, I think to best understand glutamatergic hypothesis, it to us understand that the baseline function is the best option in terms of glutamate function. These are different dopamine uh, pathways. The first one uh, is, uh, is, 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 is really, uh, most of you would know this, uh, is extends from the substantia nigra to hypothalamus, and it is called, uh, 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 actually, this is, yeah, this is called the nigrostriatal, uh, not hypothalamus, but a striatum, nigrostriatal uh, pathway, uh, which is actually is uh, uh, highly relevant in, uh, uh, in Parkinson's. Um, Actually, yeah. So, so uh, let me let me correct. Uh, so, these regions are very close together uh, in 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 near the ventral tegmental area and the and the um, uh, substantia nigra and the um, uh, uh, sort of the midbrain region. Uh, so, so the diagram is not very well made. It's not my diagram. So, basically, uh, let me recorrect. So, so the the uh, the track you see from going from uh, uh, perhaps wrongly from substantia nigra it actually is going is a tubero-infundibular tract, which actually is uh, responsible when you block dopamine activity in this uh, uh, circuit, uh, you cause uh, an increase in prolactin. So that was not nigrostatal. We will go to that. So the next one I showed you is actually the nigrostatal pathway because it's going to the basal ganglia, these triatal areas. That is the nigrostatal pathway where blockade of dopamine activity can uh, uh, can result in Parkinsonian effects and Parkinson's disease has reduced activity in this uh, circuit. And then uh, another one which goes from the ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens uh, is the one which is uh, the, uh, the mesolimbic dopaminergic tract, uh, which uh, actually is uh, uh, highly relevant uh, in the mediation of psychosis, if there is ex excessive dopamine activity in this in this tract, so so that is psychosis. So let me repeat: uh, tubero and fundibular increase in prolactin, uh, block, block blockade of dopamine causes increase increase in prolactin, hyperprolactinemia, uh, mesolimbic uh, increase activity of dopamine causes psychosis. Uh, uh, meso, uh, 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 I'm sorry, nigrostriatal blockade of dopamine activity causes extrapyramidal symptoms. And then the last but not the least is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 starts from the ventral tegmental area and goes into the, uh, in the higher cortical centers and it is called the mesocortical uh, uh, tract. And this mesocortical tract is extremely, extremely important in mediation of some of the very important cognitive functions 
uh, and also in the mediation of the depressive or affective symptoms. Um, sometimes the negative symptoms in schizophrenia may also appear because of decreased dopamine activity in this tract. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so basically, uh, uh, you know, the dilemma has been. Uh, I, I think I should uh, explain the the most basic pathophysiological model of schizophrenia, is that schizophrenia has been a dilemma uh, to be treated. Uh, why? Because if you target dopamine activity, if you give uh, blockers of dopamine, uh, they are going to improve psychosis. But there is already a prefrontal hypodopaminergia, which means there is a decrease of dopamine activity in the higher cortical centers. So when you block uh, uh, the mesolimbic tract to treat psychosis, you also further block the already inhibited activity of dopamine in the mesocortical tract. So that is why there is a very fine balance between giving an antipsychotic dose, because if you give excessive, you further negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms and maybe effective symptoms as well. Uh, but if you, uh, uh, while you treat psychosis, right? But if you give you just a dose, which actually does not compromise the mesocortical function as much, then that is the most best dose to treat psychosis, uh, uh, provided that that dose is effective in treating psychosis. So these are very important uh, for dopaminergic tracts and extremely important to remember when, especially when you're using antipsychotic drugs. So dopamine function, we already talked a little bit about that. So I'm not going to, but, but, but just the movement, you know, uh, motor function, uh, you know, extrapyramidal symptoms uh, occur because of modulation of the dopamine activity. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, rocket science to understand that dopamine is involved in motor function. Um, uh, so, um, and when you block uh, the uh, meso, uh, I'm sorry, nigrostatal pathway, uh, dopamine activity in that tract, you actually cause extra pyramidal symptoms. So, so that reward, we all know how reward, rewarding dopamine uh, activity is. Uh, the, all the basis of uh, drug of abuse, uh, uh, you know, um, is, is actually explained by, by dopaminergic systems because it induces the reward mechanisms, which actually makes you uh, repeatedly uh, have a repetitive behavior in taking drugs of abuse. Addiction, same thing. Uh, memory, um, uh, dopamine actually, I just told you that the mesocortical dopaminergic tract actually goes to the prefrontal cortex and is, improves certain cognitive functions uh, of which one of the most important one is working memory. Um, yeah, and, and, and then attention and other, uh, you know, cognitive uh, actions, uh, the flow of information, decision-making, response inhibition may be held by dopamine. Uh, and uh, decision making is is based on response inhibition and conflict resolution, so that can be uh, uh, facilitated by dopamine effects. Norepinephrine. It is a stress hormone. We all know that. I think if somebody asks you, what is the basic <clears throat> function of norepinephrine, uh, you say it is the mediator of a stress when it is released in uh, excessive amount. And um, you know, the time is just flowing. We already have done. Um, uh, Yushe, should I continue a little bit more? I'm sorry, I'm just uh, taking too much time. Yeah, sure. Uh, it depends upon how much of the material is, uh, is left. You can continue. Yeah, I think uh, we have some more material. Uh, but you know, what you're getting is uh, some in clinical information as well. So it may not be all uh, basics, uh, uh, but, but as you understand, as you see this, this is important. So norepinephrine is a stress hormone. Uh, I think uh, uh, all of you would know post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, in that, uh, uh, the norepinephrine is actually one of the major uh, contributor uh, to PTSD. Uh, normally, uh, norepinephrine goes uh, up, uh, level goes up when, uh, you know, when you are under a stressful, uh, condition or a fearful or, uh, 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 you know, fight or flight situation. Um, uh, but, but after the situation stress is over, it comes down to the baseline. But in PTSD, it remains elevated. So that is why the patients with PTSD will, will have 
excessive nor, uh, nor adrenergic or nor epinephrine activity even when uh, they are not uh, having the stress because uh, uh, which is actually <clears throat> is very interesting that they have that that uh, chronic uh, elevated norepinephrine level even when uh, uh, because you know why the reason uh, maybe that they are having flashbacks they have uh, nighttime intrusive symptoms and they have the daytime intrusion symptoms so so they never get out of that stress maybe that is one explanation but that is why uh, when there is excessive activity of norepinephrine in post traumatic stress disorder they lose the ability to do any other uh, works which are enjoyable uh, because they are under stress they are in a fight or flight mode they are not going to be able to enjoy anything uh, in life and that actually is a very important concept to have that uh, the ptsd patients uh, suffer from arousal attention cognitive functions biosynthesis we already discussed that dopamine uh, results in uh, through uh, dopamine beta hydroxylase activity into norepinephrine um they are also in vesicles um, as we discussed in the first lecture uh, there is a nor norepinephrine reuptake transporter protein in the prefrontal cortex uh, uh, which actually takes up the excessive norepinephrine available in the synaptic cleft uh, but the these uh, uh, norepinephrine reuptake transporter transporters are relatively um, actually not the norepinephrine but the dopamine reuptake transporters are relatively deficient in the higher cortical centers so norepinephrine takes over the takes over the job of uh, taking up reuptaking excessive dopamine as well it's an important point to remember because it will be relevant when i'm discussing the antidepressants and the adhd drugs okay uh, many different type of sub receptors they are metabotropic so the, uh, they are uh, they are not uh, inotropic uh, alpha 1 beta 1 beta 2 alpha 2 Uh, alpha 2 receptors are auto receptor uh, i think you must have noticed that these auto receptors are available uh, in um, uh, every system neurotransmitter system and the reason is uh, that uh, again checks and balances nature has given you a system in your brain which actually checks and balances the activity of it so this is just to maintain the homeostasis uh, to uh, to maintain uh, normal brain function uh so this is a diagrammatic illustration of that uh, so you can see the alpha 2 receptors in the presynaptic neuron are at the presynaptic level so that is uh, that is a site for auto receptors okay so that is why when you give alpha 2 agonist such as clonidine or guanfacine you actually decrease the release of norepinephrine but you give the alpha 2 antagonist like mirtazapine which is an antidepressant it increases the flow of norepinephrine now i just learned this is the latest actually hot of the press did anyone in, did anyone know that pancreas can make dopamine i didn't so this is a this is really a fascinating study by dr faber uh, uh, which was uh, just recently published in translational uh, neuroscience that uh, actually uh, pancreas regulation of glucagon uh, glucagon and insulin Uh, is is mediated by adrenergic and dopaminergic receptors uh, i'm not going to talk in detail about this one but but if you are interested you can either ask me question or can go to this uh, authors uh, um, you know to the pubmed uh norepinephrine receptors um alpha 1 receptors are extremely important because uh, when you stimulate them they cause extreme vasoconstriction constriction Uh, as a matter of fact uh, norepinephrine is the most potent ever uh, neurotransmitter to uh, to cause vasoconstriction through alpha 1 receptors and that is why when you block alpha 1 receptor you cause dizziness postural hypotension uh, and light headedness and there's a risk of fall especially in the geriatric population so when you give alpha 1 antagonist you are extremely extremely careful alpha 1 antagonism are commonly used in the management of blood pressure as well as uh, the the uh, uh, night time intrusion symptoms in ptsd to improve the sleep efficiency uh, such as uh, prazosin uh, alpha 2 uh, are also uh, uh, receptors are extremely important i told you already they are they are auto receptors 
uh, and they are involved in the regulatory release. Uh, uh, they regulate the release of nor norepinephrine uh, from the presynaptic neuron. Beta one uh, in heart uh, and 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 brain as well. Beta two lungs, of course. We know that the vasodilators have uh, modulation of the beta two receptors. Beta three are also uh, uh, receptors which uh, actually are postsynaptic receptors. Uh, not a whole lot uh, I know about these receptors. Uh, beta three receptors. Norepinephrine. Um, again, the next uh, is that norepinephrine reuptake pump blockade is one of the major mechanism of action uh, to mediate the antidepressant effect. And, and that explains why the tricyclic antidepressants as well as the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors uh, actually involve norepinephrine. Although I must tell you that tricyclic and SNRIs involve serotonin as well uh, um, with the one exception. The uh, tertiary, I mean, tricyclic antidepressants involve both serotonin and norepinephrine but the secondary amine tricyclics involve only norepinephrine. There is a drug which is called atomoxetine, which is used to treat uh, uh, ADHD. It's a non-stimulant treatment, which also is a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which, all, uh, which just blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and not serotonin. Functions, uh, stress we talked about, um, uh, blood flow to the muscles, uh, uh, heart rate increases. So just, you know, uh, one easy thing to remember norepinephrine function is just remember what do you do under stressful condition. And you will know all of this. Your people will dilate, your interest, uh, uh, muscle, intestinal muscles and the, uh, um, will relax, but your skeletal muscles will be stimulated, activated because you want to run, uh, if that is the case. Um, breathing increases because the metabolic requirements increase. Heart rate increases because more blood is reached to supply the uh, activated muscles and uh, other uh, systems. Blood sugar increases because you need uh, 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 glucose to, to have uh, aerobic uh, uh, metabolism to facilitate a fast uh, movement of the muscles. And then um, the blood pressure increases because alpha-1 receptors are stimulated because you need uh, 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 more blood uh, going through uh, those systems. <clears throat> um, so in this case, I think uh, it is uh, counterintuitive, but when you uh, uh, vasoconstrict, uh, then the pressure of the blood increases, so it, it probably enhances its uh, uh, circulation and, and uh, reach, I guess. Um, norepinephrine pathways. Uh, locus ruleus, I think everybody would know that because that is a very common question asked in the MCQs. Locus ruleus is the main site for the norepinephrine pathways. And as you can see, the alpha-2 receptors and the beta-1 receptors have different, slightly different locations because they have different mechanisms uh, to mediate. Uh, alpha-2 receptors can be, uh, can actually be relaxing. Uh, I'm sorry, alpha-2 agonist can be relaxing. Uh, they can uh, cause uh, hyper, uh, reduce hyperactivity. They can uh, uh, also help uh, uh, reducing the stress-related anxiety, as you can see. But the beta-1 receptors offer a different mechanism. Um, uh, the beta receptors are extremely important uh, in another tract, which I just wanted to show you. Yeah. So the beta receptor, uh, the beta, uh, the norepinephrine, I'm sorry, the norepinephrine pathways uh, uh, going to the limbic system are extremely important because these are the systems which are going uh, mostly to amygdala. And the beta receptors, that was the reason I was uh, emphasizing beta. So the beta receptors in the uh, amygdala are one of the major uh, uh, receptors which actually mediate the fear response. Uh, and that is why beta blockers sometimes actually reduce the fear response if given to ADHD patients. Uh, because the basolateral uh, nucleus of amygdala is the site where D2, uh, these beta, beta receptors are highly activated under conditions of anxiety. Uh, and then cerebellum. Don't forget cerebellum because you know cerebellum is a very unique uh, uh, piece of neural tissue, which is uh, uh, unique because it is completely opposite to the, to the other part of the brain, being that uh, the distribution of the gray matter and the, the white matter. But not only that, uh, we didn't used to know this, and this is relatively recent, that cerebellum actually modulates every function of the brain. Uh, 
And that is why there are major connections between other brain regions and cerebellum. Uh, and it's not surprising that norepinephrine has extensive uh, 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 presence in cerebellum. Serotonin, um, Yusha, should we stop or? Um... Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Mujib, I think we should stop and okay. see for a few questions if there are any okay. For, okay. related to today's okay. presentation. Meanwhile, Dr. Mujib, can you uh, see the chat box? Uh, there's a question that I have put there. Okay, the chat box. Uh... Oh, hold on, I think I... Uh, let Just me, uh, yeah, let me uh, read it oh, out. I, for... see I see that now. Okay. Yeah. The bar was missed here. Um, Asan has asked the question, or who is, who, where is? Okay, so uh, 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 let's start with my question. I asked uh, around when you were discussing about uh, how anticholinergics are used for sleep, but uh, they are not very good in promoting deep sleep. Rather, they just increase the unrestful sleep. Yes. So, uh, so most of the time we give tricyclic antidepressants and they have anticholinergic properties. Uh, what do you think about how this all adds up? Because REM sleep is already increased in depression and we are giving them tricyclics that is as well anticholinergic. So isn't it like that maybe some symptoms of depression might get better, but sleep might get worse gradually? Yeah, so, so let me rephrase what you're asking. Um, so the anticholinergic effects uh, actually... Uh, uh, don't uh, don't have much effect on the deep sleep, which is the delta sleep, right? They have effect on the REM sleep, uh, and and the REM sleep sleep is a paradoxical sleep, in which there is increased activity in the muscles. And uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So 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 there's no effect on the delta sleep, which is the slow wave sleep. Uh, so so basically, by suppressing the REM sleep, uh, what it does is that. REM sleep is actually the rejuvenator of the brain. It actually uh, consolidates the daytime memories. Um, your, your, you know, and your hippocampal activity is is very uh, activated during those times, and and, and the self referential activity, self awareness, uh, and all those activities which are uh, important in survival actually are uh, uh, updated. Uh, and so, without the REM sleep you are going to have cognitive problems. You may also have uh, affective uh, problems and, and, and the brain function will, will, uh, will, will uh, be compromised. So that is the first thing. Uh, the reason why it is not restful because REM sleep is extremely important in giving you a restful sleep. Although delta, delta sleep is, is, is uh, more important, but REM sleep uh, plays a, a, a major contributory role, okay? Uh, and then in terms of tricyclic antidepressants, uh, so tricyclic antidepressants are actually of two types, I just told you. One is secondary amine tricyclic and one is the secondary amine, uh, I'm sorry, tertiary amine. One secondary amine, one is, is tertiary amine tricyclic. So the uh, secondary amine tricyclic will not have a much anticholinergic effect. They will have some, but, but not close to what the tertiary amine have. Uh, so they are rather more selective. And this we will discuss again in the anti antidepressant lecture. Uh, and it's very important. These are important concepts to have. Uh, so, so medication like uh, nortriptyline, medication like dizipramine are not going to cause much uh, anticholinergic activity, especially in the adult population. Uh, in genetic population, there are no guarantees because even a minimal anticholinergic effect can be disastrous in, in that population especially if they are going through the early process of dementia or cognitive issues, right? 
So the tertiary amine tricyclic antidepressants are the major problem because they have plethora of effects, which are mostly undesirable. They have alpha-1 blocking effects, which cause postural hypotension. We just discussed that. Uh, dizziness, lightheadedness. Uh, uh, they have um, uh, H1 blocking effect, which cause increase in weight. Uh, uh, they, they are sedative. They cause uh, may cause uh, problematic over-sedation. Uh, and that is where the diphenhydramine story comes, the Benadryl story comes. Uh, but, but again, uh, the sleep through antihistaminic effects is not restful as well. Uh, and then the anticholinergic effect, which are also inherently uh, uh, present in the tertiary amine tricyclic antidepressants, cause further problem as we just discussed on the REM sleep. So yes, uh, uh, you know, anticholinergic medication and antihistaminic medications can help you go to sleep, but the quality of sleep is not that good. Does that make sense, Yushe? Uh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, Dr. Shah, there's another, uh, there are two more questions right now. One is, yeah. uh, can you please tell about what are metabotropic drugs? And the other one is from Dr. Madha Fatma. And she is asking that uh, the dilemma you explained related to treating schizophrenia when it comes to treating it with anti uh, dopaminergic drugs. So you told that, please elaborate on the point regarding hypoactive dopaminergic transmission in prefrontal cortex and hyperactive in mesolimbic pathways, and yeah, that the yeah. former can be further deteriorated with, uh, beyond certain limit of antipsychotic dose in schizophrenia. Does that also indicate that beyond certain daily dose of antipsychotics, negative symptoms might worsen, even if the positive ones uh, are getting better? Yeah, that's a great question. That's exactly actually is an uh, uh, is is a, a statement which is absolutely correct. That um, you have to keep a ba fine balance between anti uh, uh, between between the antipsychotic dose which is effective in treating psychosis and the one which causes uh, uh, a prefrontal dopamine blockade and resulting in uh, uh, exacerbation of cognitive deficits which are already present in schizophrenia population and also maybe starting or uh, enhancing negative symptoms in the higher cortical centers. Not only that, but blockade of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex also can increase the depressive symptoms in schizophrenia. So these are all the, 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 uh, high, uh, the high baggage, the, the prices, high prices you have to pay if you overblock dopamine systems in the brain. That is why I have been the biggest proponent of using uh, minimally effective dosages to treat psychosis. Uh, so, um, so for example, uh, you know, haloperidol, uh, one of the drug which is used in mega dosages uh, in state hospitals here in America, and I don't know in Pakistan is still being used at high dosages or not. I think a lot of people might be using it in high dosages. You know, to tell you the fact, uh, it's an important point to remember that uh, the, the researcher who actually uh, uh, found the molecule haloperidol, Dr. Jensen, who actually created the Jensen Pharmaceuticals uh, about uh, uh, in uh, uh, around mid fifties, uh, 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 actually uh, uh, based on his research, uh, even at that time, that early, he actually suggested that the average dose of haloperidol should not uh, exceed seven milligram a day. Can you believe it? So, so basically information is out there. The question is whether we are looking at it or not, whether we are motivated to learn, whether we want to improve the quality of life of our patients, you know. Any other question, Yushe? Uh, yeah, there was one that uh, metabotropic about that. Uh, what are metabotropic receptors or things like that? Metabotropic receptors, you know, if you see the last presentation, I have tried to explain a little bit, not in detail. You will see the major differences between the ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. So uh, we just discussed norepinephrine uh, receptors are uh, metabotropic. And uh, uh, a couple of main things that metabotropic receptors are much more complicated than the ionotropic receptors because they result in G protein coupled reactions which involves uh, uh, cascades of reaction to eventually result in protein synthesis, 
uh, uh, and the eventual uh, treatment uh, response or lack thereof, uh, uh, not in every patient gets treatment response, right? So, so metabotropic receptors, the other important thing is, since there is a fast passage of electrolyte from the ion channel, the effect of inotropic medications are almost immediate. But with the metabotropic receptor, it is a long way to achieve the effects because there's a whole cascade of reaction involved with metabotropic receptors. Okay. Uh, I guess these are all, uh, if someone wants to ask something or say something, I guess uh, they can unmute their mic and they can say. Hey, uh, Aslan and Dr. Shah, can you, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's raining really bad over here, so it might be some background noise of some, some rain, thunderstorm. Dr. Oh. Shah, I just had a quick uh, question. Um, I wanted to get your, your, your feedback in regard to um, benzodiazepines and their effect on the sleep cycle, which cycle they affect, REM or delta, and uh, any long-term ramifications of using benzodiazepines. Yeah, so basically uh, they enhance GABA activity. And when you enhance uh, GABA activity, you might actually um, uh, uh, cause issues with the, with the REM sleep, you know? And, and so uh, again, benzodiazepines can, uh, again, they, they may not be as restful as uh, the drugs which actually uh, <clears throat> uh, act on the dopamine systems. Um, so benzodiazepines uh, may relax you, may calm you down through the inhibitory effect of GABA uh, uh, neurotransmission in the brain, as we just discussed. But the benzodiazepines actually uh, may suppress uh, REM sleep. Uh, and also, I remember that the research has shown that the effect of GABA on delta sleep is also not uh, good. Does it answer your question, Jason? Uh, yes, it does, Dr. Shad. So, Dr. Shad, um, I mean, these drugs are pretty common in the market, you know, like Benadryl, and uh, I've taken these medications sometimes, sometimes myself, my family or friends do it yeah. too. So yeah. what are the long-term uh, like effects? Like if these common population and they keep taking that, keep affecting their REM sleep, will they have cognitive effects in long-term, like permanent? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, and I'm glad you asked that because I don't want to over-alarm everybody about use of uh, um, occasional use of diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Uh, so the issue is that the young people like you have a very large reservoir of cholinergic activity. And if you take it maybe once a week or twice a week, nobody has done research so that I can give you a definitive number in terms of time, uh, you will be fine. Uh, you will still be able to sleep and you won't develop any cognitive deficits. Uh, you'll be fine because there are huge compensatory mechanisms in the brain which neutralize the, the short-term effect of using short-term uh, Benadryl, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you don't need to be concerned. But when you're using these drugs in patients who already have cognitive problems, uh, mm -hmm. such as elderly uh, patients with dementia uh, or other cognitive issues, uh, you have to be extremely careful uh, because uh, I would never, never uh, support use of uh, anticholinergic medication of this potency, at least in the uh, old population, even in young patients who have some cognitive problems uh, like memory problems, and you should be very careful in using these agents. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shah. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yes, if you use them uh, occasionally, uh, uh, there are uh, no long-term effects. Okay, thank you, because I've used them sometimes myself. Yeah. So. Okay, I guess uh, Yushe, you want to decide about next time. Uh, I think we should uh, uh, maybe leave uh, the rest of the slides and do an interactive session next time, or what do you think? Yeah, that would be better. I think we should do uh, the interactive session. And I uh, like, I, we were discussing it, uh, the, the book you suggested stalls uh, psychopharmacology. The first yeah. three chapters are related to these basic concepts. Maybe we can give that a read ourselves and have some interactive session next time. Yeah. The more questions, the merrier, right? Yeah, that would be great. And Dr. Shah, uh, and if you have any, any um, if, if you don't mind me adding some input, um, if, if there are any common drugs or, uh, you know, that you would want us to take a look at or uh, that are really common in the field, because I'm going to be starting a rotation in a couple of weeks. 
and I just want to know what um when you any ideas that could probably give yeah. me up a hand or yeah. You know. yeah so basically we will discuss that after the interactive session the okay. fourth session we can spend on antidepressants if you want okay yeah sure that work and, and then next session you can ask these questions too although we are not directly related uh, discussing the drugs we are discussing the ba basic mechanisms but there's no uh, restriction on asking questions on anything okay thank you Dr. thank you okay guys thank you so much thank you everyone i guess uh, let's start thank you dr shah thank you